Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore universal patterns in nature. With me is Jude Curavan, a cosmologist and archaeologist. She is the author of The Cosmic Hologram and co-author with Irvin Laszlo of Cosmos. She is also author of The Eighth Chakra and um, if I recall correctly, the 13th step. Is that Indeed. right? The 13th Indeed. step uh, and, and several other books as well. Jude, what a pleasure to be with you again. Thank you, Jeff. As always, it's a real delight mm -hmm. to be. In, in your book, The Cosmic Hologram, you notice that there are certain mathematical patterns, Fibonacci series, the golden... Uh, uh, the golden mean and, and many others. Yeah, the gold yes. that, that was discovered by the ancient Greeks. Pa patterns that are sometimes thought of as esoteric mathematics, mystical principles in, in mathematics itself, going back probably to the Pythagoreans, mm -hmm. uh, that can be found throughout nature. And, and this suggests uh, an underlying, uh, well, the Platonists would, would call it underlying forms. That, Indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the Neoplatonists certainly would do that too. Yeah. I agree. I mean, what we're finding, of course, thanks to computers and the ability to analyze vast amounts of, of, of information, of data mm -hmm. and information, is these patterns, as you say, underlie all we call physical reality and yeah. certainly the complexity mm -hmm. of, of physical reality. Mm -hmm. Now, um, some theorists consider uh, higher dimensions of space mm -hmm. more than the three dimensions mm -hmm. we experience through our senses. Sure. Uh, where do you stand on that? Well, you know, we've known f the whole of the 20th century physics relies on non-physical dimensions to yeah. actually uh, uh, exist at all. I mean, mm -hmm. quantum mechanics requires a non-physical dimension uh, called the co complex plane, mm -hmm. uh, and many other laws of physics do also. Mm -hmm. And what we're realizing is that the complex plane isn't just a mathematical nicety, it's a requirement, it is a reality of itself from which physical, yeah. the appearance of physical reality emerges and more and more that's being understood yeah. that our universe is an emergent phenomenon of this deeper non-physicalized mm -hmm. Uh, nature of existence. Now, these complex planes uh, are sometimes, I think, thought of as imaginary. It was called the imaginary, you know, yeah. which is quite the square root of minus one is uh -huh. I for I right. for imaginary. Then, no, in a way, they're imaginal. Yeah, imaginal. They're in other imaginal. words, they, one might say they actually represent a level of consciousness itself. Oh, indeed. And I mean, more and more we're understanding that we can't sort of separate mm -hmm. consciousness. You know, this, uh, this question of how does mind, immaterial mind, arise from the material brain is being understood more and more as being the wrong question. Mm -hmm. That instead of mind arising from matter, that mind is matter. Mm -hmm. Matter is mind mm -hmm. and consciousness is all In other words, we exists. have to rethink what we mean by matter. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we only, we only sort of see matter as being real mm -hmm. is that, you know, because it seems solid. Yeah. And yet when we drill down to subatomic entities, we realize and have done for many years that they're 99 point 999999999999% no thing nurse and what's left aren't tiny little billiard balls they're excitations mm -hmm. within consciousness mm -hmm. and we're also realizing that information you know not raw data not random data but patterned meaningful in formation literally informs mm -hmm. what we call reality and you find that these patterns run from uh, into sociological oh, uh, indeed. situations, not just biological or, or natural or cosmological. <laughs> the, the human behavior itself is yeah. uh, 
patterned this way in a collective way very much so mm -hmm. I mean what you're referring to are, are the sort of well l let's perhaps just take a step sideways yeah. in that complex plane that you you spoke of this non-physical realm there are what's called attractors mm -hmm. and the attractors are sort of boundaries of information and that but those boundaries of information whilst themselves appearing very similar from that simple from that apparent simplicity emerges amazing diversity and abundance of phenomena mm -hmm. and as you say the same patternings that we see for example in ecosystems mm -hmm. we see within the internet the internet the way the internet relates yeah. through its nodes of websites and pages mm -hmm. and, and its processes of information exactly the same as a biological ecosystem. It's as if when I set up a website, as, as we have, and other people link, and I hope they do, to the <laughs> New Thinking Aloud uh, site, uh, it's it's almost the equivalent of, of a neuron forming a new axon, forming a new synapse. Yes, and it is self-emergent in the sense that when you set up a website, mm -hmm. you can link it consciously to other websites, but you have no knowledge, no control often, of of how other websites may link to you mm -hmm. and yet and that's exactly the same as an ecosystem system an ecosystem exists and evolves as an entity you know we can't think and we know this biologically and I write about it in the cosmic hologram we can't think of a say a biological entity uh, a bird right a separate from its surrounding milieu right. it's an ongoing informational dialogue Ecosystems are co-evolutionary partners. Mm -hmm. The entirety of Gaia is a co-evolutionary partner with all the beings that are her children. And it's the same with her internet. Mm -hmm. It develops, it grows, it evolves in exactly the same way mm. without anybody, any one person say, oh, let's do that or let's do that. It emerges, mm -hmm. it evolves as a, as a, an entire Info system. One, one might say that in our <laughs> lifetime, the internet is uh, giving birth to what I would think of as a planetary brain. Indeed, and in fact, when we go back a hundred years, just mm -hmm. after the Second World War, there were three philosophers, including Théa de Chardin, who coined the term noosphere. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that we've moved from a planetary geosphere, we are talking geology earlier, yeah. through to a biosphere. Mm -hmm. We're actually almost in a transition at the moment, through a technosphere mm -hmm. into that noosphere. Mm -hmm. In other words, planetary consciousness. Planetary consciousness, mm -hmm. yes. And surely, yeah, this is something quite unique. For the first time in my lifetime and in your lifetime, humans have the capacity to see what our planet looks like from a vast distance, from the edge of the solar system. Well, absolutely, and even beyond that, because by seeing our, there's a, absolutely amazing, as you know, photographs of our tiny little Earth. Tiny from, blue dot. Oh, amazing but also I think that the, the, the technosphere as it were and mm -hmm. the internet and the connectivity and our technologies you know our virtual realities mm -hmm. and our holograms you know what I'm really feeling is they're the kids toys as we potentially go through this next stage of our evolution mm -hmm. as a conscious rather than a biological evolution mm -hmm. to literally expand our awareness mm -hmm. to realize that our entire universe and exists and evolves as a conscious being and mm -hmm. we are microcosmic mm -hmm. co-creators yeah. of its reality and, and I know that your thinking is in alignment with that of my old friend Barbara Marks Hubbard Indeed. who talks about conscious evolution that we can now yes. observe these patterns and work with them Absolutely. to consciously guide uh, our evolution very much so because what these are showing and what I'm talking about mm -hmm. is ultimately is, is is that all we call reality is ultimately unified mm -hmm. and diverse and diversely informed and manifested. Yeah. So when I talk about unified reality and unity awareness of that, I'm not talking about homogeneity. I'm talking about the empowerment of the unique meanness mm -hmm. within the collective weeness mm -hmm. within the whole world view of unified reality.
Now, one example that you write about uh, would be crime statistics. Indeed, and, and any statistics, any collective behaviours mm -hmm. are revealing the same patternings mm -hmm. that we find throughout the so-called natural world. Such as earthquakes. Well, indeed. I mean, one of the things that we understand now about earthquakes is there is no such thing as a typical earthquake. Mm -hmm. So if we actually look at thousands of earthquakes, what we can do is we can graph them. Yep. And on a very simple graph, we can show the power of earthquakes and it's logarithmic mm -hmm. in terms of the power right. of earthquakes against the frequency mm -hmm. of earthquakes yes. and if we if we graph thousands of earthquakes we find instead of an average all of them cluster along a straight line called mm -hmm. a power law which shows that the only thing we can really say about earthquakes is that an earthquake of twice the destructive power in logarithmic terms, which is the Richter scale, yeah. uh, Gutenberg-Richter scale, is approximately four times less likely to happen, less mm -hmm. frequently, okay? Yeah. That's what we can say about earthquakes. But what we can also say is that those earthquake patterns mm -hmm. are reflected in human conflicts. Mm -hmm that when we look at human conflicts, however amazing that sounds, at the end of the Second World War, Lewis Richardson um, again looked at hundreds of human conflicts, right. put them on a graph, destructive scale in terms of number of deaths, mm -hmm. frequency, same power law. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, a human conflict of twice the destructive power, approximately, it's a yeah. slightly different slope, four times less likely to happen. Mm -hmm. And that work's been updated by uh, Neil Johnson and his team at the University of Miami mm -hmm. to show exactly the same patterning for insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan. So just think about that for a moment. Well, I think about it in two ways. One suggests that maybe the, these kinds of conflicts uh, for all the pain they cause are inevitable. They're going to uh, always occur. And yet, uh, uh, another thought I have is a little more hopeful. Can we use this information somehow? Yes, because the, the attractors that actually give rise to human conflicts, the attractors that give rise in a natural way to earthquakes, but those attractors that give rise to human conflicts are basically an informational patterning mm -hmm. of our consciousness, of our collective mm -hmm. consciousness. And our collective consciousness for a long time has primarily experienced the appearance of reality as being separate, mm -hmm. as being duality based. It's yeah. not just that mind somehow is separate from matter, but what that does is it also suggests the appearance of separation. Mm -hmm. And what we're now realizing is that reality is ultimately unified. So reality is real, but separation is a myth. Mm -hmm. And it's that myth of separation where I'm different from you, I'm different from you. If we're family, mm -hmm. we'll hold together, we're not so different. But if it's another country, or if it's someone with a different ethnicity, mm -hmm. that we can think that separation gives rise to fear. Mm -hmm. So we play those fear-based perspectives mm -hmm. out in our fear-based behaviors, which are conflicts, we can co-create an attractor instead of fear, an attractor of love. We can create co-create attractors of peace. Well, doesn't the same, the, the same mathematical principle hold in the cosmos as a whole, like the yes. collision of galaxies? Of course. And, you know, the way that consciousness co-creates the, the reality of our universe mm -hmm. is through an appearance of separation. Because I learn about myself mm -hmm. through you. I learn about myself through my relationship with, with yeah. the earth mm -hmm. and with others and the cosmos. Yeah. So the appearance of reality, so the appearance of separation mm -hmm is integral to reality, but it's the myth of separation yeah. because ultimately everything is fundamentally interconnected. Everything is fundamentally part of our universe that exists and evolves as a unified entity. Well, let me throw a tough question okay. at you. Uh, war. Yes. War occurs because one group of, of people 
decide that it's in their best interest to kill yes. other human beings. They're willing to kill other human yes. beings and they become enemies yes. because uh, because they're willing to kill each other or because they perceive that the uh, enemy wants to kill them. Sure. How, how do you uh, overcome that level of disconnection? I think two things. Um, I've, I've working with a lot of folks who, for example, are working with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. And one of those 17 goals is how do we bring about peace? Mm -hmm. across the world. Yeah. But all the other 16 sustainable development goals, whether it's the education of women and girls, whether it's getting greater equality in the world, for me, what those sustainable development goals are all about, or SDGs are about, they're in responses mm -hmm. to our dysfunctional behaviors, yeah. such as you're describing. Mm -hmm. But as a healer, as well as a cosmologist, I know that those dysfunctional behaviors, rather like the symptoms of a dis-ease, mm -hmm. come from our collective dis-ease. Yep. And our collective dis-ease for me is our, our, our perspective, our fragmented perspectives yep. of the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. If we believe the world is separate, yep. then we believe at some level the world's a dangerous place mm -hmm. and that other folks are dangerous. So kill or be killed, yeah. dog eat dog. Mm -hmm. If we actually can heal those fragmented perspectives mm -hmm. into a whole worldview that understands that actually reality is unified and mm -hmm. we're not separate, instead of separation and, and fear, yeah. perhaps we can understand that with all our diversity, we can empower the uniqueness of the me, celebrate the diversity mm -hmm. of the we, realize the abundance of, of our beloved Mother Earth, mm -hmm. and perhaps find ways to peace. But I do appreciate that the appearance of separation, of duality, has caused major traumas mm -hmm. within our collective psyche. So as Ken Wilber says, you know, we need to wake up, grow up, show up, and mop up. Mm -hmm. We can't just go, oh, reality is unified, how wonderful. We also have to realize that there's emotional trauma that still has played out mm -hmm. in these residual ways of, of dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And we have to find ways of healing that. Well, one of the patterns uh, that seems to exist throughout the world's religions is a, a justification for war. You have the idea of, of, of the noble war and, yeah. and that war is uh, where men achieve glory. Glory being like almost a, a religious term like beatification. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, e even the Bhagavad Gita from the culture that brought us nonviolence seems to suggest it's okay to kill your relatives if that's your duty and don't worry about it. God will take care of everything. Only God uh, is responsible for life and death. So uh, it, it's sort of like, you know, shoot first and ask questions later. God will take care of everything. Uh, it seems to me that that's, that's a pattern that's deeply embedded throughout many cultures. It is a deep pattern. It is a very deep pattern. And, you know, the idea of God will take care of it. There's still that duality. There's still that separation yeah. of somehow God's out there mm -hmm. and we're here. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of, you know, many spiritual traditions, the mystics of those traditions, have actually explored the nature of consciousness and the nature of reality at a very profound level. And at that profound level, most, if not all of them, have realized that the nature of God is God is everything. Mm -hmm. God is, like Einstein said, cosmic mind, mm -hmm. infinite, eternal, of which our universe is a finite thought form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, within that, and yeah. we are microcosmic co-creators. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that we're at a point in our evolutionary journey where science is also discovering this ultimate unified understanding mm -hmm. of reality where God isn't there. Yeah. He, she, it, mm -hmm. not to genderize God, but really understand that God is the infinity of cosmic mind. The universe is a macrocosmic expression mm -hmm of cosmic mind in its finiteness, mm -hmm. we are microcosmic. Mm -hmm. And that all the religions ultimately 
reveal themselves as many different paths up the same mountain. Yeah. Now, I know you draw to some extent upon the work of Stanislav Grof, and uh, he's written a book called The Cosmic Mind, which e expresses some of these principles, but he also writes in, in The Cosmic Mind that uh, things that cause humans to normally yeah, laugh or cry, uh, look especially cry, look different from the perspective of the cosmic mind. Things that might seem terribly tragic to us uh, are just part of the natural functionings of the cosmos. To some degree, in the sense that if we move beyond the sort of the space-time perspective mm -hmm. of, of, of separateness, because yeah. we've convinced ourselves of separateness, mm -hmm. it, yeah. it isn't the reality. But it's, it's as if a young teenager needs to yes. experience separateness in, in order to develop their sense of self. I agree. I have no issue with any of that. Mm -hmm. But there comes a point where the separateness is so extreme mm -hmm. that it's brought us to a point where we can not just destroy ourselves as a species, mm -hmm. but also destroy our planetary home and all the other species yeah. and sentient entities that are part of the of the of the consciousness of Gaia. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can do that. And yes, the cosmic mind will go, yeah, another planet gone. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be part of an awareness that takes that path. I will be part of an awareness that understands and realizes the unified nature of reality that comes mm -hmm. to understand and experience and embody unity awareness because mm -hmm. For me, unity awareness isn't a sort of a grey gloop yeah. where everything's homogenous. Mm -hmm. It actually is the most incredible expression of the uniqueness of each microcosmic co-creator mm -hmm. within the we-ness, the diversity, the celebration mm -hmm. of, of ourselves as a human species within a, a larger sort of holographic scale of our entire planetary home within the cosmos. Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that we are teenagers, I'd even say, I know we are in that sense, but I would say even earlier than that, mm -hmm. I feel we're at the school gates. As a species. As a species. Yeah. We're like four-year-olds, we're at the school gates. You know, what will we learn? What will we expand? What will we go on to mm -hmm. if we are able to understand and experience and embody unity, awareness, and express its wonderful diversity. Mm -hmm. Instead of through war, through peace, through art, through joy, through love, mm -hmm. through growing up enough to become a spacefaring species mm -hmm. that then reaches out to other spacefaring species throughout our galaxy. Mm -hmm. One of the um universal patterns that you've written about is the way in which cities evolve uh, comparable to the evolution of galaxies. Yes. Uh -huh. um, two ha Harvard astrophysicists, Loeb and Lynn, a couple of years ago, looked at population densities mm -hmm. of cities and galaxies. Population densities, people in cities, population densities, stars in galaxies, mm -hmm. and showed that cities grow in the same fractal patternings that galaxies form. Mm -hmm. And we're finding that at all scales. Um, a, a, a physicist called Ali uh, uh, Yazdani understood that when at phase transitions at the atomic scale yeah. create fractal patterns of electrons, those same fractal patterns play out in, in, in uh, clusters of galaxies. Mm -hmm. Margot Srimjur and her team discovered the same patterning mm -hmm. of the webs that tie galaxies together. Now, for our viewers who may not know, uh, I know fractals has been a buzzword <laughs> now for a long time, but yes. can you define that term? It's, you mentioned earlier about geometric forms. Of yes. course, the ancient geometers understood idealized forms like triangles, mm -hmm. okay? And you can scale up triangles and scale them down. Mm -hmm. And a certain shape of a triangle, this is an equilateral triangle, right. where its, its sides are three sides of the same and its internal angles are the same. Whether that triangle is that size or that size, mm -hmm. its relationships are exactly the same. Yes. But they're idealized, mm -hmm. okay? When we, uh, it, when computers came along, a wonderful uh, researcher called Benoit Mandelbrot mm -hmm. started to analyze vast amounts of data and realize that when you do that, what what is underlying complex systems 
are geometries, is geometries, but instead of idealized geometries, they're fragmented dimensional geometries, mm -hmm. which is a big long thing. He turned the fractals. Yep. So we find these beautiful patterns, these geometrical relationships of fractals mm -hmm. scaling up and scaling down mm -hmm. through many, many different systems. Patterns nested within patterns. Nested, nested within nested, nested within nested within nested. Yeah. Uh -huh. And essentially holographic. Mm -hmm. Which is how we, we would say that even a, a tiny little human being can be a reflection of the entire cosmos. Essentially, yes. I mm -hmm. mean, it's a little bit more complex than that, but essentially, yes. And we also find that just the way our behavior patterns and our emotional patterns play out. You know, we play out the patterns of our individual lifetimes, but don't we often find them playing out in our families? Mm -hmm. Don't we find them often playing out in our nations or our ethnic groups? Mm -hmm. Don't we play them, find them playing out throughout the whole of our human family? So consciousness in that sense mm -hmm. expresses itself in these patternings because everything is And you as an archaeologist are a student of, of the great mythological traditions of antiquity. Yeah, one might say that, that those are patterns as, as well that unify the individual to the life of the culture. Absolutely. I mean, Joe Campbell wrote about the, the hero with a thousand faces or mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the mythic perceptions, the mythic stories play out the hero's journey, you mm -hmm. know. It's a journey of awareness. Mm -hmm. It's a journey from, I talk about it being for journey from loneliness mm -hmm. to aloneness to all oneness. From loneliness to aloneness to all oneness. To all oneness, that's lovely. <laughs> well, Jude Curavan, uh, once again, this has been a uh, multifaceted, thrilling, holographic uh, <laughs> discussion, and, and I hope enlightening as, as well. I hope in some small way we can actually contribute to less violence in the world. I hope so, and you know what I'm writing about in the Cosmic Hologram and the whole world view it brings forward is a way, you know, it's a direction of travel for, for science across many, many different fields, but it is reconciling with universal spiritual experiences mm -hmm. to reveal the unified nature of reality. And I hope that helps to bring us together because we've been mm -hmm. apart for a very long time yes. and for too long. Yeah, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. And thank you as well for being with us. Thank you.